Good morning. The first item of business is general questions, and at question number one, I call Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it can provide an update on any discussions it's had with the UK Government regarding infrastructure. Minister Jenny Gilruth. We meet with UK Government counterparts to discuss matters of importance to Scotland, including infrastructure, as required. I was certainly disappointed that no UK Government Minister was able to meet with me this week in London on the matter of rail infrastructure. Mr Carson may know that this has been a key feature in the ongoing Network Rail RMT dispute. It was furthermore disappointing that the UK Government's November autumn statement did not enhance the Scottish Government's capital budget. The UK Government have failed to protect our capital allocation against inflation, pursued a hard Brexit and tight immigration laws and presided over volatility in the financial markets. All of this is impacting on our ability to deliver on capital investment plans. Finlay Carson. Uh, unfortunately, I really don't thank the Minister for that response. Last week, there was yet another horrific accident in A75 when two HGVs lorry uh, collided in the village of Crockett Ford. One of the vehicles overturning hitting several parked cars, a pedestrian crossing before careering into a house. It was a miracle nobody died. Sadly, it's just another statistic, but for the people living in this small village, it's becoming all too often. I've lived next to the A75 all my life and witnessed the aftermath of hundreds of accidents, far too many resulting in the loss of life. Presiding officer, report after report highlights the need for significant improvements on the critical link to Northern Ireland, with a bypass around Crockettford and Springholm at the top of the list. But only last week, Michael Matheson said that union connectivity had fallen off the table, only to, to be undermined by Jenny Gilruth, who said discussions were ongoing. But this is not about party politics. The people of Dumfries and Galloway and cross-party MSPs demand these bypasses. Nothing less will be acceptable. Can the Minister confirm that positive talks with the UK Government are continuing and commit today to these bypasses so communities will not have to wait a moment longer for the much-delayed STPR2? Minister. So I very much recognise Mr Carson's constituency interests on this matter and I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment today on any one individual uh, incident, although I am aware of the incident of course in question. Now of course my officials in Transport Scotland engage on a regular basis with their counterparts in the DFT. I am advised at the last meeting, which I think was held on the 31st of October, when the A75 was discussed, uh, the DFT confirmed that a proposal would require to be submitted by the Scottish Government to the UK Government to approve the release of any funding for the A75. So there's no guarantee from the UK Government that any additional funding is available um, and any money of course that might be received from the UK Government would most likely be best targeted in further investigation of preliminary options for a local bypass as I think Mr Carson alluded to of Springholm and Crockettford and that has been identified through the SCPR2 process. But of course it would be for Transport Scotland to lead and manage this work because the trunk road network belongs to Scottish ministers. And irrespective, I have not received any substantive update from the Chancellor on this matter. It would be much more appropriate... I hear Mr Carson heckling from a sedentary position. I have to say this is potential. And my officials have been informed... Minister, Minister, um, can I just remind members that the only person speaking should be the person who is asking a question or responding? And can I ask too that we pick up the pace because we have a lot of interest in this item? Thank you. I've received no substantive update from the Chancellor or any other UK Government Minister on this matter. It would be far more appropriate for the UK Government to protect and enhance Scotland's capital allocation to reflect rising inflation. And finally, Presiding Officer, as Mr Carson knows, transport infrastructure investment decisions are devolved to Scotland. So if his friends, if his friends, if his friends in the UK Government want to increase funding to infrastructure projects in Scotland, then they should do so through the already agreed and established processes of devolution. Question number two, James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on any recent engagement that it's had with the energy sector regarding support for those at risk of fuel poverty. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. The First Minister has chaired two energy summits since August this year where all major energy suppliers have attended along with advice providers and third sector organisations. The summits have discussed the impact of the measures introduced by the UK Government in response to the energy crisis and agreed that the UK Government should be targeting more support towards those living within vulnerable circumstances. Other outcomes include the Scottish Government commitment to work with the public and private sector partners to explore how those living in fuel poverty can be further protected within our devolved powers. James Dornan. 
thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. At the last summit, the Scottish Government agreed to work with Energy UK and other organisations to increase, increase smart meter coverage in Scotland. And whilst aspects of smart meter usage are helpful, the Minister will be aware of the shocking and frankly immoral actions of energy companies who are using smart meters as a backdoor to switch consumers to prepay mode often on a more expensive tariff, without informing people or having to apply for a warrant. And that this has already happened to over 150,000 households, with Ofgem estimating a further 180,000 households will be affected this winter. Can he say how many households in Scotland this has happened to, and whether this is in fact legal, given that previously companies would have had to apply to the Scottish courts for a warrant before taking such action? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, although I can't give an exact figure, we are aware of instances where energy suppliers have switched their customers' accounts to a prepayment mode without informing them first or obtaining an a warrant, a warrant beforehand. Uh, this, is, uh, this can have uh, quite serious uh, implications uh, for customers, particularly those living in vulnerable circumstances. Uh, we would certainly condemn uh, this kind of practice as it is likely to exacerbate the challenges that some households in fuel poverty will already be contending with. I have asked my officials to engage with the Ofgem directly on this matter and to look for action to be taken. In the meantime, I would like to reassure members that if they do have a constituent who is affected by this, that they can seek advice through our advice services, primarily through Advice Direct Scotland. Mercedes Vialba. The UK's major energy distributors made £15.8 billion in profits last year, despite rising energy bills putting more consumers at risk of fuel poverty. Unite the Union is calling on Ofgem to reopen its price review and set a clear cap on the distributors' profits. Will the Minister join Unite in urging Ofgem to act now to end this rampant profiteering? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, I certainly do support the need to make sure that we are uh, taking a fair tax return from those who are making excessive profits within our energy sector and energy companies in uh, particular. Uh, but I, do, I would just gently point out to the member is that we are in a situation where we are seeing energy companies making record profits. Scotland, one of the most energy rich nations in Europe, but actually has one of the highest levels of fuel poverty in the whole of Europe. Rather than actually writing to UK government ministers, pleading with Ofgem to take action over these matters, I prefer to have the powers here in this parliament yeah, yeah. to tackle these matters yeah. so that we can tax these companies properly and we can end fuel poverty once and for all yeah. in energy-rich Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Some of my constituents are experiencing significant delays in having faulty meters replaced or repaired as energy companies have contracted out this work to third parties. Already impacted by high levels of fuel poverty, they face increased anxiety about their bills. Our island areas are also experiencing market failure and new electricity contracts for both business and domestic consumers. Has the Scottish Government had any discussions with the energy sector about these serious problems? Cabinet Secretary. Saying, officer, we raise these issues and these types of issues on a regular basis with uh, Ofgem and also with the UK Government, who are ultimately responsible for these matters, including issues relating to energy uh, meters and also the failures in the market and regulation of the market, which are evident and actually adding to fuel poverty and the very high increases that people are facing in their fuel bills now. If the member has some specific examples that she wants us to ensure are highlighted to Ofgem, I'm more than happy to receive that information and make sure that we follow it on to Ofgem and ask them to take urgent action in addressing these matters. Question number three, Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent dialogue it has had with the UK Government regarding the potential impact on Scotland of the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. Cabinet Secretary Angus Robertson. Uh, I met with the Foreign Secretary two weeks ago and urged the UK Government to seize the current window of opportunity to re-engage in good faith with our European partners, seek sustainable shared solutions on the Northern Ireland Protocol and to withdraw the bill without delay. The bill risks violating international law and sparking a trade conflict with our European Union neighbours in the middle of a cost of living crisis with potentially disastrous consequences for Scotland and the whole of the UK. This is simply indefensible. Jenny Minto. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. 
In the SEAC Committee report on the Legislative Consent Memorandum for the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, the Committee reiterated its view that the extent of UK Ministers' new delegated powers in devolved areas amounts to a significant constitutional change. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that to ensure that the Scottish Parliament has the opportunity to effectively exercise legislative powers to ensure Scotland is a fairer, greener and progressive country, the real constitutional change required is for, the West, is for Westminster to keep its promise of, the 20, of 2014 that power lies with the Scottish people to decide how Scotland is governed and grant a Section 30. Cabinet Secretary. Well, in, indeed, it would be far better for the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government to be able to make decisions uh, in this area. And in general terms, people in Scotland, of course, have made uh, a clear decision to be offered the choice about this country's future in a referendum. And we call on the UK Government to respect that decision, to open discussions uh, with the Scottish Government on a change to the Scottish Parliament's powers so it can be given effect to the mandate of the people of Scotland in the Scottish parliamentary elections last year. And the easiest route to do this would be through a Section 30 order. Thank you. Question 4 is not lodged. Question 5, Ruth Maguire. To ask the Scottish Government how citizens can influence energy consent planning decisions made under the Section 36 application process. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, citizens are able to engage in the planning process by making representation to Scottish Ministers on live Section 36 applications. Measures are in place throughout the planning and consenting process to ensure that views from the public are taken into account when decisions are made. Guidance is available to encourage applicants to undertake early and meaningful engagement with citizens who would be affected by a proposed Section 36 application. Ruth Maguire. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I recently met with constituents in Lylestone who told me that they feel they're in a David and Goliath scale fight with a company proposing to build a large solar farm on farmland next to their village. They expressed worry and anger that the company concerned is acting as if the project is a foregone conclusion. I seek reassurance from the Scottish Government that this is absolutely not the case and that concerns and objections of residents of the village who'd be most impacted by the proposed development will be taken seriously and acted on. Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, the uh, Planning and Electricity Act application process uh, has a, a very clear mechanism within it to ensure communities and members of the public can have their say when proposals are submitted. Uh, ministers and, of course, the planning authorities carefully consider all views which are submitted and uh, considered during the application process. The merits of each proposal um, are considered on their own individual merits on a case-by-case -case basis and are carefully balanced against a range of different matters that have to be taken into account, including environmental, economic, renewable energy and climate change benefits. Uh, the purpose of this is to ensure that communities do have an opportunity to feed into this process, and I hope that provides reassurance to the members' constituents and it is an open and transparent process for doing so. Question number six, Alec Crowley. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to address the reported decline in numbers of National 5 and higher pupils taking STEM subjects in schools. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. We are committed to encouraging young people's ambitions to pursue STEM subjects. The evidence tells us that they continue to do so with the percentage of STEM entries at higher and National 5 stable this year compared to 2019, when the last year in which exams were held. Since 2017, we've been implementing our STEM strategy, which includes work to ensure ongoing take-up of STEM subjects. For example, the work with organisations such as Raising the Aspirations in Science Education to equip practitioners with the skills, networks and confidence to deliver engaging STEM experiences and also our continued to support for the Young STEM Leaders Programme. Alec Crowley. Presiding officer, we could trade back and forward a whole load of statistics, but I would hope the Cabinet Secretary would agree that we're not doing good enough when it comes to Scottish education and we need to do better. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary specifically whether she will agree that we need to prioritise, firstly, by 
sort now the teachers' dispute. It's absolutely shocking that these teachers who have been through so much are finding themselves having to be forced onto picket lines to defend their pay and their jobs. And secondly, would she agree that we need to have every local authority in Scotland, the Education Authority, bring forward proper costed recovery plans so that these can be scrutinised by democratically elected councillors at a local level and by this Parliament so that we can start to address the massive failings in Scottish education? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm afraid I don't recognise uh, the picture that Mr Rowley is painting of Scottish education, and I think that is to be proven in the work that is ongoing in the national discussion when we are told that there is a lot uh, that is successful and that is good in Scottish education. So while I appreciate um, we must always look to see how we can do better, I think it would uh, be advisable if we also recognise what is uh, going well um, and the good position that we are in at the moment. We are, of course, continuing to liaise um, with all teaching unions around uh, the current uh, pay dispute. That work is ongoing. Uh, industrial action is in no one's best interest, particularly that of children and young people. And of course, we are also um, very close to the publication um, of the stretch aims as part of our Scottish Attainment Challenge, which are set by local authorities specifically to look at what is being done in each local authority to ensure that we are very careful looking at attainment within the councils. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I recently attended a Girls in Energy conference hosted by an energy operator and their college partners that supports girls to undertake a one-year course in S4 and provides a platform to pursue a career in energy. So given the sector is still considered to be male-dominated, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what action the Scottish Government is taking to maximise opportunities for girls and women to pursue educational pathways and a career in STEM? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Audrey Nicholl for that um, important question and a challenge that we must all rise to, to increase not just the number of um, pupils that are interested in STEM, but particularly uh, young uh, women as well. I absolutely recognise the contribution that girls in energy um, have, uh, the courses that they support um, in Audrey Nicholl's uh, constituency. And this is very much integral to our work within the STEM strategy, ensuring that equality um, is absolutely an important part. And that is exactly why Education Scotland, for example, continues to work with improving gender balance in their qualities team uh, to look at that. Sue Webber. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, the declining number of pupils taking STEM subjects at NAT 5 and higher appears to have coincided with a drop in applications to study medicine. UCAS figures show that 19 per cent fewer Scots have applied to study medicine for the 2023 academic year than in the past two years. Is the Cabinet Secretary concerned that not only is there a drop in pupils studying STEM, but there is also a drop in the number of Scots applying to study medicine? Cabinet Secretary. Well, if I can perhaps point to the um, original answer that I gave to Alec Rowley about the entry and attainment will inevitably vary from individual subjects, but that's why I answered um, with an overall percentage of STEM entries. It is particularly important to recognise that there are a number of new STEM subjects out there. So uh, mathematics is also joined by the application of mathematics and biology by human biology. So we take very seriously our desire to increase the number of pupils that are taking STEM subjects. And then, of course, whether it's medicine or otherwise, to encourage um, young people to take forward uh, uh, an opportunity within our colleges, within apprenticeships and with universities with STEM as the basis of that subject. Question number seven, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, President, officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to ban the installation of replacement fossil fuel boilers from 2025. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government published its Hearing Building Strategy in October 2021, which set out how we propose to remove emissions from Scotland's buildings by 2045, in line with the country's climate change targets. As committed to in this year's programme for government, the Scottish Government will publish, will, will consult on uh, in details on proposals for a Hearing Buildings Bill in the coming year. This will include uh, further detail on how we propose to phase out the use of fossil fuel hearing systems from 2025, as committed to in our strategy. Jeremy Balfour. President officer, for people making decisions now about heating their home, we should be able to have a clear idea from the government about how impending regulations will impact them. 
However, key messages about what we have to do to their homes to make them compliant are not being relayed. Instead, the government continues to make vague suggestions of what regulations might look like. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell concerned homeowners when they can expect comprehensive details of what regulations will come into place from 2025 regarding the need for replacement boilers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, President Officer, if the member is looking for contra contra con concrete examples, he just needs to look at the strategy because the strategy sets out that the early action in off-grid is actually focused in 2025 on those who are off-grid gas supplied at the present moment and by 2030 for those who are on-grid in gas supplies. So the strategy sets that out very clearly and I hope the member will share that information with his concern, concerned constituents. The statutory regulations which will underpin that will be brought forward in the draft bill, which will be consulted on, which will set out the details in regulation. So I hope that provides a clarity that the member is looking for as it is set out in the strategy, which was published last October.